stock markets clearly hung over on the first week of the new year, taking it on the chin all week long. And the question now, of course, is U.S. jobs data going to be a saving grace or is it going to be more of the same? That's the last thing um, on this very busy macro calendar for the first week of 2024 that we're going to focus on here today. This is, of course, Macro Money. I'm Ilias Pivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And indeed, the question in front of us is, will December's U.S. jobs report save stocks here? Uh, now, obviously, the sell-off has not been awful. It's not been um, anything catastrophic, as it were. But the results so far on the week are relatively one-sided. Um, S&P down almost 2%. These are um, weekly numbers, of course, so they're not complete. We still have tomorrow's session to contend with. But the pacing is um, not terribly encouraging. Uh, S&P, uh, as, as we see here, uh, pacing down almost 2% on uh, the week. NASDAQ pacing down 3 Point four, uh, that lines up nicely with a three point four percent increase in the ten-year yield, a three uh, and change uh, increase in the two-year yield. Crude oil here s seemingly doing its own thing, uh, possibly uh, echoing the back and forth in geopolitical headlines. Um, there's been skirmishing in the Red Sea. There's been uh, an explosion in uh, Iran uh, and all manner of uh, of headlines here. Um, that explosion apparently not linked to anything going on with Israel and uh, the Hamas conflict. It seems more so um, some sort of internal uh, fighting between uh, the regime and Islamic State, which actually claimed responsibility. But um, the overall backdrop for oil seemingly not a part of the overall macro picture and more kind of back and forth around this headline or that the dollar though much more convincingly higher here we're looking at the euro um, us dollar exchange rate here as the proxy for the dollar's overall direction the euro of course its most liquid counterpart uh, and we see here the euro down uh, almost one percent that echoing a decline of almost 1% in gold. So uh, holding crude oil aside, there does seem to be a very clear narrative that kind of screams out to be noticed here. Stocks down, yields up, gold down, dollar up, all of which seems to be an almost perfect inversion of everything that we saw in markets in November and December. And this is really uh, the main thing here. So in the red line, of course, is the S&P 500. In the gray bars is the outlook for Fed monetary policy this year. This is uh, backed out from Fed funds futures, and it's the spread be between where the January futures contract implies rates are and where the December one uh, shows we're going to be at the end of the of the year, and that gives us how many rate cuts the markets are now baking in. And we can see that as more rate cuts were getting baked into these um, rate expectations, we can see that that happening from sort of late October, early November. The S and P surges, and now that we've seemingly settled on that amount, and the move has stopped so too have stocks. So we can see here is the adjustment, here is the surge. We seem to have found something of a sweet spot here over the past two, three weeks or so, hanging uh, around six or so cuts, now a little bit less. And as we've started to see a little bit less, so too stocks have come in. It's a similar story for uh, the U.S. dollar on the other side of this equation. Again, as yields have started uh, to come up, 
because rate cut expectations have moderated, the dollar has revived a little bit after this very aggressive decline, a near perfect mirror image of what we saw in stocks. So from the peak um, in uh, late October, early November for the dollar and the bottom at the very same time for stocks, a very kind of orderly reflection of what's going on with Fed policy odds across markets, making this week a sort of retracement week within the trend that was established, give or take now, two months ago. This leaves us with a Fed rate cut outlook that at this point sees the cut fully baked in, the start of it, um, in May. That's a little bit of a climb down. Uh, the peak in uh, Fed rate cut odds was actually December the 27th, so just before the turn of the year, right in the final days of um, of last year, where we were looking at the first cut fully baked in for March and six cuts all the way in the market with about a 40% chance for a seventh by year end. What we see now has calmed down some, but it's still relatively emphatic. So now the likelihood of a, a cut in March is down to about 70%. Still very strong, still, still likely, but not exactly all the way. That cut is fully baked in for May with, with about a 53% chance for a second second one and then the easing cycle extends so that second one there in june the third one in july the fourth one in september and then we get to a fifth one by december with a 53 percent chance for a sixth so we're still narrowly angling in the direction of six but the level of conviction has significantly watered down, and it's five that we're sure of looking at the markets at the moment, down from six that the markets were sure of just about a week ago. So that seems to explain what we've been watching here with stocks, with bonds uh, coming in as yields uh, rise, with the dollar, with the yen uh, weakening insofar as the yen, um, as we've talked a lot about on macro money here, tends to move inversely of yields and with bonds. So the adjustment across markets really seems to have uh, been very kind of on theme, crude oil aside, uh, but we are still looking at a very significant easing cycle that's built up over the course of two months in the outlook. And then the question naturally, as we look at this US jobs data is, well, has the economy done something to suggest that this is what is needed? And with that, we look at what's expected out of this jobs data. The expectations are for outcomes that are pretty middle of the road. 175,000 uh, jobs are expected to be added to non-farm payrolls. That's well within the recent range here. So if this is kind of where we've been idling since mid-year, somewhere between 105 and 260, 280 or so, 175 lands right near the middle of that range, maybe a touch softer. But a controversial number, this is not. Similarly, for the jobless rate, we're looking for a slight uptick to 3.8%. Again, nearer the top of the recent range. If you want to call the top about 4 and the bottom about 3.4. But certainly nothing catastrophic. Certainly nothing that materially changes where we've been basically since the beginning of 2022. So the range of expectations here is not for any kind of controversial outcome. Now, it seems likely that what actually occurs 
is going to be pretty similar to what this looks like. Because as we look at how economic data has responded in recent months, what we see is from about the middle of August, U.S. economic data has moved closer and closer to baseline forecasts. So this is uh, the economic surprise index from Citigroup. So we can see here from May through uh, about August, what we saw was U.S. economic data meaningfully improving relative to forecasts, suggesting that economists' models were too pessimistic, that they were expecting growth to be weaker than it actually turned out. And so we can see data really outperforming forecasts here. Now, around mid-August or so, this turns. And what we end up seeing is the data starts getting less of a, a margin of surprising higher, and the index is now essentially down to within a hair of zero, which means that the difference between expectations and the outlook has been almost completely shaved away. Which makes sense when we consider that while the outlook for economic growth in 2025 is barely budged for obvious reasons, there's not really enough economic data or leading data to say with any confidence much of anything about what's going to happen next year. But what we can see is over this same time period, so August through to the end of the year, there was a pointed increase in U.S. GDP growth expectations, which seems to suggest that what's going on here is the market's revised growth forecasts. So as we were surprising higher, analysts said, wait a second, this economy is doing better th than we thought. Revise forecasts. G growth is going to be better. So that's essentially just raising the bar. And as you raise the bar, incoming outcomes have a harder time clearing the bar. And so the spread between what is baseline and what is a surprise higher starts to narrow. Data starts losing its ability to surprise higher and has now basically arrived in a place where forecasts are probably pretty finely tuned. So the results on NFP should be, give or take, in line with these forecasts because the forecasts themselves recently, after this adjustment in expectations, seem to have generally followed with uh, what has been expected. We saw this in spades really throughout this week with a whole host of labor market indicators. So job open openings. Of course, a little bit lower than the prior number, but only a little. Very small adjustment here. No real major shift and give or take close to forecasts. ADP, the uh, estimate of the private sector payrolls numbers, again, very close to forecast. Expectations were for one 25, we got 164, so a little bit better than expected, but again, well within the recent range, not really a controversial outcome, given the range that's persisted recently. Jobless claims numbers uh, that just came out uh, earlier today, we of course saw what looked like a pickup in initial claims uh, going back to the start of the fourth quarter. But so we can see things have kind of anchored. So middling outcomes for the, the, the most part. And in particular, I would, uh, I would take the attention and focus on the averages here. And, and in, in particular, the 12-week average seems to have kind of flattened out. That's about a quarter's worth of data. And what that's seemingly suggesting here is, again, nothing is going anywhere very quickly. Things have kind of leveled off. It's a similar thing with continuing claims. This, of course, was a particular area of concern. 
because what we were looking at here was increasingly from about uh, the start of the fourth quarter, uh, a sense that people that have lost their jobs are finding it in, uh, increasingly difficult to find a new one, and so are renewing unemployment benefits. So uh, this surge in continuing claims was seemingly suggesting that uh, maybe the economy is starting to deteriorate more acutely. Looking at what's been going on here in recent weeks, again, sort of a flattening out. The four-week average is still kind of static. Now, the 12-week average here is, of course, much more of a troubling uh, perspective. It's it's pointed strongly higher, but that's what you'd expect after a very aggressive Fed rate hike cycle and that doesn't necessarily alter the near-term calculus for this jobs report per se. The more relevant recent data seems to imply that things are, for the most part, anchoring. And so as we look at what all of this reflects, we come to uh, the latest set of purchasing manager index numbers uh, for this uh December period. This was just updated this week with final revisions. And we see that from about August, the U.S. economy has barely budged. So in the logic of PMIs as ever, uh, 50 is neutral, above 50 is growth, below 50 is contraction. The further you go above 50, the faster the growth. The further you go below 50, the faster the contraction. What you find here is that we're essentially hugging that 50 line, holding just a touch above it, but not really going very far or very fast on the composite index, which takes collectively both manufacturing and services. Manufacturing still in contraction mode, services still cautiously growing. Services, of course, a much bigger part of the, of the overall economy, close to 80%. Uh, so we can see here that the composite index tends to broadly follow with where services are going. And manufacturing is kind of oscillating around that central uh, tendency. So what we find here is that basically since August, the U.S. economy hasn't done much of anything. It's grown a bit. The growth has remained positive but at a snail's pace, which of course lines up with economic data losing a sense of volatility and with forecasts lining up, as we see here, more closely with what realized results look like, where essentially since August, there has been ample time to observe the economy, to make adjustments, to get the models right, all of which seems to suggest that nothing in the underlying landscape is going anywhere very quickly. And so then, of course, comes the natural next question. If nothing is running away anywhere, if we're likely to get outcomes that are broadly close to forecasts, if Nothing about the U.S. economy over recent months has really screamed this or that very forcefully. And the sense now seems to be more of the same is coming in this jobs report. Then, understandably, the question becomes, well, then why do you need all of these cuts? What sort of an emergency developed? between October, sort of late October to early November to now that we are now looking at as many cuts being baked in for next year as we did at mid-year when we were worried about the aftermath of the SVB-led banking crisis and perhaps a significant fiscal headwind from the U.S. failing to increase the debt ceiling. Now, of course... A default in the U.S. is a ridiculous uh, sort of a proposition that's 
not even remotely in the cards anywhere as far as I'm concerned, um, nor is there even a price for something like that in the market because the U.S. debt in its role uh, as the risk-free benchmark for uh, the entire gl global financial system remains entirely unchallenged and is, in fact, a fundamental feature of the financial markets globally uh, that really has no no impetus to change, nor is it something that could be changed without the system itself becoming fundamentally something else. And of course, the US dollar continues to be the dominant unit of commercial exchange with nothing else even remotely on the radar as a placement and again it is such a given in the current system that to assume that would change would be to assume that there is an entirely new global order economically something that we have not seen uh in the let's call it post world war ii post gold standard uh sort of period and clearly none of that is immediately on the cards here or even has a price, really, in the current environment. So the risk of the U.S. debt ceiling really is more about if the government stops spending for some amount of time and government spending is an input into GDP, then GDP is just lower. So there's weaker economic growth if a debt ceiling issue hangs longer. And of course, at mid-year, both of these things were kind of conspiring to spook investors. So, so they were baking in all, all kind of aggressive rate cuts uh, to, uh, to counterbalance. Naturally, the question now then is, are we in the middle of some kind of a crisis or in the immediate aftermath of one that we need this many cuts if nothing is going anywhere very quickly, at least at the moment, at least as far as the data seems to suggest right now? That doesn't mean it won't change. That doesn't mean something won't come out out of left field. I, I've spent a lot of the past several weeks um, on this uh, very show talking about the possibility and the threat of some kind of a debt dislocation eventually as markets reckon with managing a vast pile of debt at much higher rates than a year and a half, two years ago. But evidence of any kind of uh, issue like that is plainly not there right now. It may yet emerge. But looking at specifically where we are today and looking tactically at how this jobs report might influence that, the baseline seems to be, well, the economy has simply not come unglued in a way that would suggest that between November and right now, six rate cuts needed to get factored in in a hurry. To put it simply, the market thinks the Fed is going to sprint into a policy change this year, and the economy seems to think that nobody is sprinting anyway. Indeed, as we just saw here, from August, looking at that gray composite line, not, nothing is going anywhere very quickly. So the question then becomes, well, let's say you do get outcomes that are basically in line with expectations. What then? Well, the contrast then becomes, once again, front and center. That indeed the economy isn't falling off a cliff, nor accelerating in a hurry. And that rapid policy change in whichever direction, in this case, obviously, the adjustment was in a dovish direction, but in whichever direction, isn't something that is being overtly justified, at least at the moment. And so perhaps a middling outcome broadly in line with forecasts is something that gives more of an unwinding here. And so stocks extend lower, rate cut bets come in some more, and the U.S. dollar manages to build a little bit more on these gains. As it happens, the Fed is forecasting three cuts for 
this year. So relative to that, the markets still look over their skis to the tune of two cuts. So if we were to get more of an adjustment in a, in a sort of deflating of euphoria direction, then there does appear to be room to come down if what the Fed has said is the reasonable baseline. So an outcome in line with, with expectations might well then be consistent with weaker stocks, weaker bonds, higher yields, a stronger dollar, weaker gold, much as uh, the performance so far this week would have it. The longer-term question, of course, uh, becomes, is this then a trend uh, change? And the jury's still out on that score. But when the Fed itself seems to be calling for rate cuts, the trend does still appear to be broadly positive, at least for bonds, maybe for gold. And rates do seem still to be biased broadly lower for the year. But the current setting of markets relative to what this data is likely to show still suggests there is room for the end of 2023 bonanza to moderate before there is another opportunity uh, for the longer term dynamics to reassert themselves. And that is macro money for today. As ever, um, we are here right after overtime, Monday through Thursday. That's a show that I co-host with Chris Vecchio and Dylan Radigan talking about what happened on Wall Street on a given day and what that might mean going forward. I'm back on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, on with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sundays, writing for the News and Insights section of TastyLive.com and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Elias Pivak. Thanks very much for joining. Happy trading. See you for Futures Power Hour tomorrow. Take care.